Hello, Antiochian men. This is Bryce Kirk with another interview in our Amen interview series. We have a special guest with us today, and that is Father James Gerges, pastor of St. Raphael of Brooklyn Mission in Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. Father James is one of the guest speakers at the recent second annual Dom C. Fall Retreat in Franklin, Tennessee. Father James, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. Thank you. I wanted to start this interview off by asking you to introduce yourself. So if you wouldn't mind, would you please explain uh, how long you've been a priest and what led you to join the priesthood? Well, I've been a priest for about 12 and a half years. And um, what led me to join the priesthood was uh, a calling that uh, came to me probably when I was a junior in college and uh, came very unexpectedly. Um, I had never thought or, or dreamed about uh, serving the church in that way um, as a youngster, uh, but the Lord has a sense of humor and uh, he finds a way to use us even though we're, we're not very useful people. And uh, by the grace of God, I've been able to do that and uh, I'm uh, very thankful for all of his blessings and the ability to be able to do that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. So when you were introduced at the fall retreat, just before your talk, um, Father Philip Begley mentioned that you were an author of the book, Ask for the Ancient Paths, Discovering What the Church is Meant to Be. Yeah. Would you mind explaining to us what this book is about and what motivated you to do it? So I wrote that book a few years ago, and um, it came out of a practical necessity. Uh, when I would have people come and visit the church uh, when I was serving at St. George Utica, New York, or now New Hartford, New York, um, I had trouble figuring out which introductory books to give to people because I found many of the books were a little bit too uh, theologically advanced or uh, had, had kind of a scholarly flavor to them. And so I was looking for something that would be uh, simpler, more down to earth. Um, the other thing that I encountered with some of the books is that sometimes they were offensive in their approach from, from the first or second chapter. And um, for me, that's, that's not the way that we evangelize and, and teach people. Uh, we don't start by offending them and calling them all heretics and schismatics and then expecting them to listen to us. Um, so, I wanted to try a different approach, and um, at some point I, I sent a message to uh, Ancient Faith Publishing and asked them whether they would be interested, and they said that it sounded like something uh, that they had in their pipeline already, but that I should write the book and send it to them anyways. And, uh, and so that's what I did, um, by the grace of God, and I sent it off to them, and uh, it's really been received well by many people, and I'm thankful for that. I think it's it's reaching some people that aren't normally reached by uh, those types of books. Um, and it's meant to be the book that you think about when you are dealing with a Christian who doesn't know anything about orthodoxy. It's meant to be that book that you just hand to them because it's short and sweet, and uh, I, I believe it's non-threatening. Um, and really, what I do is try to break down a lot of the major doctrines of the church and practices of the church, uh, show where they come from in uh, scripture as well as in the early church fathers, uh, and, and show how we have to have a recourse to holy tradition, because if we just go by the Bible and scriptures, we may end up lost, and we may end up uh, really not knowing our head from our feet. That's excellent. I think um, that sort of work definitely would have helped me when I was a catechumen um, and several others inquiring into the church. So, yeah, thank you very much for sharing about that. Um, and I really did find your talk uh, at the Fall Retreat excellent. Um, it was titled Becoming Good and Faithful Servants. And in that talk, you went through three critical characteristics of becoming a good and faithful servant. And I just wanted you to talk about... Um, all three of these, if you wouldn't mind. So the first characteristic, which was obedience, uh, just so happens to be one of the four core values of Antiochian men as an organization. 
And we'd heard Father Hans and Michael Bachlick talk about the importance of obedience the night before. Uh, and you did a really excellent job of expanding on that in your talk. Um, so would you mind telling us from your experience as a priest how practicing obedience has reaped spiritual rewards for you in your ministry? You know, when you look at uh, the spiritual fathers, you look at the desert fathers, they all talk about obedience as being one of the most important first steps in, in an Orthodox life. And that's certainly true among monastics, but it's also true among lay people. And uh, the first thing is we have to be really obedient to Christ. Uh, we hear the words of our Lord, if you love me, obey my commandments. And uh, also the Lord says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So we have to take those words really seriously. And, and, and if we're not obedient to the Lord, then we don't have his blessing and his grace in the work that we do. And, and the Lord also reminds us, and, and it scares me. He says, without me, you can do nothing. Mm. And I don't want to do nothing. And I don't want, I, I, I feel like I'm working hard. But if I work hard without the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, then what did I benefit? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> uh, you know, on top of that, as, as, as a priest in the church, one of the things that, uh, that I know is that there is a hierarchy and that obedience also follows a hierarchical structure. Uh, so I have a bishop. And there's a great blessing in being obedient to my bishop. There's also a blessing in being obedient to my spiritual father. Um, within reason, of course, you know, we, we, we can't go against the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we have human spiritual fathers. But at the same time, we want to honor our bishop because he's the presence of Jesus Christ for us. You see, and uh, in the same way, you know, I would tell somebody who's coming into the church for the first time or who's learning about orthodoxy, you know, orthodoxy is hierarchical in nature. And so uh, we want to believe and to know and have confidence that the clergy who are placed before us are there by the providence of God, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to trust that from day to day. Yeah, that's all extremely excellent. Um, it really does play into the, I guess, the basis of our faith in orthodoxy and as Christians in general uh, is obedience. So thank you, Father. Um, so staying on this topic of obedience, I'd like to quote uh, what you said during your talk. Um, you said, obedience is the prerequisite to a well-ordered spiritual life. When we refuse to let others lead us, we may miss out on something that God is trying to do in our life. Um, I really think that's a very powerful statement and a good reminder for anybody watching and even for myself. So could you give us some examples of this practical advice on how we can keep this in mind during every, the everyday grind in our daily lives? Sure. So, so again, I would go back and say, we need to be studying the gospels. We need to be studying the words of our Lord. Uh, we, we need to not only study them and know them, we need to be obedient to them. And, and it's in the obedience to them that we know them even more and we know the Lord more. Uh, the next thing is, as I mentioned that day that we had the talk, um, most of the clergy I know have dozens of stories where somebody has come and uh, had a problem and they've offered some type of suggestion or, or maybe a bit of wisdom or some advice. And, and, and sometimes sadly that advice is not heeded or, or, and, and the reason why it's not heeded is because most of the priests don't demand those things. They, they want the person who's coming to them to continue to have um, free will. They don't want to impose on them, but what they want to do is to just, invite them to look at this and 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 then when they're asked what should i do well 
every once in a while we'll give an answer and say, I think you ought to do this, but you need to pray about it as well. And when that doesn't happen, sometimes there's really disastrous consequences. Um, and, you know, we can pray for people who are in difficult situations and, and we do try to help them. And again, we respect them. We want them to have free will in the way that they deal with their uh, issues and problems. Um, but it's hard to see people suffer needlessly mm. and, and to suffer when, when it is sometimes avoidable, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so I would say to the people that are, are watching and listening to the men that are, that are online, um, you know, try to be respectful and, and heed the words of your spiritual father when you can. Uh, those aren't the only important words in your life. You're going to, you, you need to balance that with prayer. You need to balance that with uh, the reading of the gospels and the scriptures. Um, and we need to discern the right way to deal with situations. But if we're not going to be obedient, we shouldn't even ask for the advice. Yeah, uh, that kind of reminds me. I think I was probably told one time, don't go to confession if you're not really planning on changing what you're going to do. Um, it's It really does take all of you to do it. So that does remind me of the second characteristic of your talk, which was humility, um, which is a, a key aspect of the Christian life. The fathers talk about it on and on. So uh, early on in that part of your talk, you said that humility is a powerful key to our growth in the spiritual life and to our service to not only the Lord, but to others as well. And you said that humility meant seeing the truth and seeing yourself as you truly are, as God sees you. And I think oftentimes we get kind of this blurred image of ourselves if we're not really being honest of ourselves, you know, where we're too lenient or we're too hard on ourselves. Um, so what can we do to try and see the realities uh, of who we are on a daily basis, Father? Well, you know, one of the um, really interesting uh, aspects of the, the the saints when you study the saints is that all of the saints see themselves as great sinners mm. and we hear these stories about them and some of the stories are phenomenal and and you know they're almost impossible to fathom saint seraphim of sarav spent a thousand days and nights kneeling on a rock and praying and that's, that's about three years. Um, and in all of that, they saw themselves as great sinners. And, and so what we can see from that is that as we grow in holiness and as we grow towards Christ, our humility increases and we begin to see ourselves as we really are. We don't go in the opposite direction where, where we say, Oh, you know, I did a good thing today. I must be getting holy. You see that that's not the right approach. Mm. Um, and and so many of the fathers warn us against uh, prelest or uh, spiritual delusion. That we want to uh, always know our own standing before the Lord. So we call the Lord the Holy One. And there's a there's a way in which if He's the Holy One then no one else is holy. You understand? Mm. We, we take our holiness from him. So we have to be repentant people. We have to be repentant. And if we're really repentant people, uh, we can avoid some of uh, the traps that might come uh, in the spiritual life. And, and, and you see all of the services of the church lead us in that direction because what do we say service after service? Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Mm. You see, as opposed to saying, thank you, Lord, for making me holy. That's, that's, that's not the way that Orthodox spirituality is done. It's always a call and a, and a challenge. Mm. And we say, Lord, have mercy, because we begin to see ourselves as we are, as we draw closer to Christ. Yeah, but uh, it just seems like that all adds up together, yeah, and it really does make sense. 
Um, so you did also, during your talk, you shared a fantastic quote from St. Jerome, uh, and I'll read it here. He wrote, let bishops hear this, let priests hear, let every rank of learning get this clear. In the church, leaders are servants. Let them imitate the apostles. The difference between secular rules and Christian leaders is that the former love to boss their subordinates, whereas all, whereas the latter serve them. We are that much greater if we consider least of all. Um, so I saw a lot of parallels with this and, and what was talked about the night before uh, during Father Hans and Michael's talk regarding servant leadership. Um, being leaders can bring it bring with it temptations that feel prideful. Uh, so what advice would you give to some of them watching this video who would want to be a leader or become a leader in their local parish or just their environment around them um, to do without becoming prideful? The, the first thing is to get married because you know, as soon as you get married, your wife will, will bring you back down to earth and will uh, bring you back to reality. And you know, in, in our relationships with people, uh they if they're close to us they hold a mirror up to us and so we can see ourselves within them mm. uh, and that's especially true uh with the husband and wife um we have to have an active life with our spiritual father mm, there, there there is no orthodox christianity uh where we are individuals isolated on an island by ourselves uh we do have some at very high levels of, of asceticism. We have uh, some of the fathers who live as hermits, but that, that is more the exception than the rule. Mm. Generally that that's not uh, the way that most of us will be saved. So we have a community. We have to be in the community and uh, we have to love one another within the community. We have to uh, share our struggles with other people within the community. Um, we continue with our spiritual father. We go to him. We're, we have to be honest with our confessions. We have to have a regular life of confession. Uh, now, regular uh, is, is an open term. It can be defined differently by different uh, priests, I think. Mm. Um, but you know, we have to have a life of disciplined repentance and that has to happen on a daily basis because if it's not happening, then it's really easy to fall into some kind of delusion. The other thing is if I'm not, uh, reading the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how would I know whether I'm progressing or whether I'm heading in the wrong direction? It's, it's the words of the Lord. It's the lives of the saints. Those are the things that inform us and, and say to us, hey, this is where you need to change. This is where uh, you need to do some work. And uh, this is where you really need to ask God to help you do it. Mm. That's all very good. That's excellent. Thank you, Father. Uh, so the third characteristic goes with the first two, um, and it is love. And I have to mention again that the first letter of the four core values of Antiochian men, it just so happens to spell out the word love. And that was done on purpose by the guys who made it. So I don't know if you talked to Father Hans or Michael before the retreat to coordinate all these messages um, when you plan to give your talk, but it seemed that a lot of what your talk had done had kind of helped build off of that other talk and they both seemed to go hand in hand. Um, so you said... Uh, the Christian servant is the one who loves because he is a child of God and God is love and he is trying to become like God. We know that the goal of every Orthodox Christian uh, is to become like God. And you explained that love is an essential part of that process. We are to love the Lord, our God and our neighbor as ourselves, but sometimes it's difficult to love our neighbor father. So what are the, what are some of the ways that we can learn to love in the way that God has shown his love to us, even when it's difficult to do so? So the first thing that that's interesting is that when I listened to the uh, lecture, the, the talk the night before I gave uh, the, the talk at the fall retreat, I was astounded at how many uh, points we had that, that lined up. We, we had never discussed or talked about anything. So I would say that the Holy Spirit uh, coordinated that and uh, thank God that it happened. 
Um, on the point of love. So there is a reward and a benefit to having difficult people in your life and, and dealing with difficult people. Um, it's a blessing, actually. And, and the reason it's a blessing is because uh, some of the saints, like St. Siloan uh, of Athos and uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, they both say that the litmus test of whether you know and love God is whether you love every man in, and, and whether you especially love those who are your enemies. Mm. So when we deal with difficult people or difficult people hurt us, um, willingly or unwillingly, you know, whether it was, it was provoked or unprovoked, whatever the case may be, we then have this litmus test and we can look and say, oh yeah, maybe I don't really have as much love as I thought I did because I'm having these hateful thoughts towards this person or that person or whatever the case may be. So I would say that what's necessary is uh, self-sacrificial love. Um, love is not uh, always convenient. Um, look at a marriage. In, in a marriage, it's, it's convenient and it's easy only in the beginning, mm. you know, because there's hormones and feelings and emotions and all this stuff happening and, you know, the newness of it all. But the commitment is, is not to lust. The commitment is to love. And, and love is, true love is eternal because God is love and God is eternal. And so what we do is we make commitments that are not convenient, that are sometimes painful, that are often self-sacrificial. And so we have to go into it with that expectation and, and say to ourselves, you know, the process of loving others can be painful. And when it is painful, that doesn't mean we've done something wrong. Actually, it's the opposite. When it's, when it's painful, that means it reminds us of our Lord Jesus Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. and, and that's our picture of love. We don't have another picture of love. That is the picture of God's love, is Christ crucified. Yes, I do remember uh, during your talk when you said that, that really stood out to me. That is the image of love. Um, so uh, kind of following up for our final question, you had mentioned St. Siloan in your last answer, and I have a quote from him uh, right here. So he says, we may study as much as we will, but we will still not come to know the Lord unless we live according to his commandments. The Lord is not made known through the learning, through learning but through the Holy Spirit. Many philosophers and scholars have arrived at a belief in the existence of God, but they have not come to know God. So, Father, you went on to say that we who are called sons and daughters of God must know God. It is not enough to know of God. And it's sometimes easy to kind of get in this whole, oh, how much have I read? You know, how much, uh, how much knowledge have I acquired um, up here? Um, and it can be really really easy to get like fall into that trap so um would you agree i mean would you agree with this and if so how do we avoid this trap and how do we stay balanced in our spiritual life of of kind of having knowledge but also an experiential faith as well you know uh, uh, there aren't any easy answers and and i'm giving you short answers uh, because we don't want uh, the viewers to fall asleep, and uh, we, we want to make sure that they that they can uh, stay awake for it. Mm. Um, it's not easy. Uh, all of orthodoxy, to me, is moderation and balance, and um, that is why I've emphasized that there needs to be life with the spiritual father, uh, with the parish priest. Um, we need to balance the things that we're reading and listening to 
along with the relationships that we have within the actual flesh and blood church around us. Mm. And we have to have that flesh and blood church around us. And that's going to help us, you know, the prayers of those people around us are powerful for us. The relationships and the fellowship we have with them is powerful. It, it changes our lives. Um, the love that we have, the, the, the sacrifice of ourselves uh, out of love for those people around us is extremely important. Those are all signs uh, and, and, and means that God is using for our salvation. When things are easy and uh, we have plenty and we're comfortable that's when we actually have to be really careful mm. you see look at look at israel in the old testament every time they became uh well fed and well nourished and comfortable they would turn away from god and rebel and begin worshiping the idols okay and we do the same thing in our own lives and so that's a real trick and a temptation because here in the United States of America, we tend to have a lot and we're very comfortable. So we have to do what the saints do. Uh, like St. Athanasius or St. Athanasius once said that if you want to understand the writings of the saints, you have to live as the saints live. Mm. And in our church, it's very clear that you that there is uh, an ascetical life, an ascetical discipline that involves our whole body. And what does that do? It takes us out of our comfort zone. And when we're out of our comfort zone and we begin to attack this comfortable flesh, um, at, we, 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 we go on a spiritual war against the passions, then we wake up to... A new reality of, or we come to reality we have our paradigm shifted a little bit we begin to see things more as they are instead of as we imagine them to be right okay and we want to be uh you know part of being loving to others is trying to be a comforting presence to others as well uh so when we are with others we should try to avoid talking about ourselves. We should try to avoid, you know, turning the focus of attention to us. Uh, we should do what we can to try to be the presence of Christ and the presence of peace to the people that we're with. And that's not always, the, uh, you know, a possibility because for whatever reason, it, it's hard to maintain a good relationship or a peaceful relationship with every single person person in your uh in your parish, hmm. but we need to go for it. We need to try. We need to uh, also be constantly leaning on the Lord. He's the one who strengthens us. He's the one who gives us the power to do these things. And, uh, and it's by his grace that we are saved and that we, we come to really know him. So we do have to balance it. You, you got to balance the stuff that you're reading with real, actual relationships with people. Okay. And there, there's plenty of stories about, you know, somebody who, who read through the Philokalia a couple times and then, you know, went off to a monastery. And as soon as they got there, they said to the abbot, Father or, uh, or, or Yeronda, uh, I would like to become a monk. I want to be a great monk, a man of prayer, a hesychast. And the abbot will quietly turn around and say, good. And he'll hand him a broom, go sweep the, uh, the, the driveway outside. Oh, wow. And that act is enough to push that person away because it, it exposes the real intentions. Okay. Right. So we have to get out of the, the, the laboratory of our mind and the theoretical and we have to really deal with other people and, and get our hands dirty. That's, that's what it is to be a Christian who loves. 
That's an excellent answer. <laughs> I, uh, I really, I found that very edifying. Thank you, Father. Um, so that's all the questions I have for you. So Father James, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. And on behalf of all Antiochian men, we appreciate you sharing uh, what you talked about at the fall retreat and more, uh, your words of advice and encouragement for all of us. Thank you very much. It's my joy and pleasure to be here, and I thank God for the opportunity. Yes, glory to God. So to all Antiochian men out there, stay tuned for some more videos that we'll have be that we will be uploading, excuse me, on our YouTube channel each Saturday. Uh, also remember to like this video, to subscribe, and to click the little bell icon on the top of your screen to be notified when new videos are posted. So once again, thank you very much, Father James, for your time today. Thank you. God bless you. 